Welcome everyone. This is Dr. Bertalomescu, the medical futurist. I hope you're having a great day because we have some excellent things lined up for you here. In this Q&A live, I will talk about plenty of things. Uh, I plan to talk about the major trends for 2022 in digital health. I plan to describe to you the, the newest ebook we just came out with, the hype cycle of the 50 top 50 emerging digital health trends. And I want to show you our newest infographics and that's one more reason to watch the live the medical future streams because you are the first ones seeing receiving the first uh, new infographics we just come out every day i hope that everything is going fine here that you can hear me and see me well as usual if you can give me any confirmation i would feel much more comfortable going into the q a live as usual our editor-in-chief judith cusco is also on the chat so if you have any questions we have an analysis for or article for a video for uh, she will be able to share those with you uh, through a link so you, you can access those right away the general plan is as usual that you can ask me any questions about the future of medicine or healthcare about the future of digital health for those who don't know me or the medical futurist uh, my background is i'm a medical doctor with a phd in genomics but a decade ago i switched to futuristic studies so I've been a professional futurist since then. My daily job essentially is to do research about what might happen next. Um, I try to find out which technological trends to focus on or what high level insights we can draw from what we see in the movement we call digital health, why it's a cultural transformation, uh, what role artificial intelligence could play in the future of medicine. I go through all these every single day and I try to provide the context around these news announcements and press releases um, to help you make better decisions on the go. I don't do this alone. I have a very supportive team to make it happen. A team of 14 people. That's what we call the Medical Futurist. You can find us on medicalfuturist.com plus all the social media channels. We publish videos on YouTube. We publish daily analysis actually many times a day on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter and Instagram. And we publish free articles on medicalfuturist.com. We do everything for free. You can access all our content for free unless you want something more, such as buying an executive summary or ebook that I will just talk about very soon, or by becoming a patron on patreon.com slash the medical futurist. Uh, so that's what we do. And we also have the Medical Futurist Institute, where we do research about the same issues and same topics. We publish high level. Uh, papers and studies about all these topics from digital health to artificial intelligence and the near future of medicine and healthcare. If you have any questions, just let me know about those in the comment section. Plus, many of you who came through the Eventbrite website, you submitted questions already. And I thought before diving in to the uh, infographics, I should answer a few of those. Um, again, I try as, as Today, we don't have a specific topic, a specific thematic issue to focus on. I will try to answer as many and as different types of questions as I can. So here's the first one. Uh, let me tell you uh, from Gene Di Fiore. And the question is, how close are we to a true replacement for the pancreas in type 1 diabetics? Diabetics, excellent question. The, art, the idea of the artificial pancreas has been around for I think more than a decade now. And what we would expect from such a technological system is to be able to administer insulin based on the level of blood glucose. And uh, that's not rocket science. It's possible to do it even in do-it-yourself terms. Thousands of patients have been doing that in the movement called We Are Not Waiting, hashtag We Are Not Waiting. But of course, we need safe and reliable and efficient technologies to become accessible on the market. And I think there are artificial pancreas systems that can do that quite efficiently based on evidence-based medicine today, even though those are quite expensive and are not true, really comfortable to use. So by answer, while answering the question, I would say that we are close to, the, to replacing the, the function of the pancreas, but not the entire organ as of yet. It's just too complicated to be get replaced by one uh, particular technology. Wow, it's quite a long question to ask from uh, Guy Andre Peluzzi. And I, I think you can't see the whole question at, at first, but you might see parts of it, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So my question is about surgical robots. Since the first surgical robot, and despite the numerous predictions, bots 
are not superior to humans. They are slow, they are expensive. More, they could have at least one negative externality. Young surgeons lose their tech skills in spending hours manipulating bots. So should we abandon, abandon bots for a time? It's a very good and very insightful question. I don't think we should abandon uh, robots or automation in general, because when we talk about automation, it's not always about robots. It can also be about algorithms that can help improve the job surgeons do during operations. It's true that um, surgical robots cannot replace surgeons as of yet. I have to say this last part because I have to be objective here. One day it might become possible to develop those robots with such dexterity and efficiency that all the potential movements um, and procedures of surgeons today could be replaced by automation, but that's simply not the goal here. It, it, it would be so expensive to do that, that it's not the goal here. The goal is to replace surgical operations or procedures in those situations where the um, these advantages of being a human um, comes into the picture, such as um, eye operations, where every tiny movement uh, or vibration that our hands might have could lead to a, a surgical mistake. Therefore, maybe in those areas, automation have a bright future, but I just can't see general surgeons being replaced by automation even in one, two decades from now. Um, and it's a good point that you're making about whether physicians, especially surgeons, can lose some of their skills because of automation coming to the picture. But that's why, even though many surgeons today use laparoscopic procedures and, and, and robotic structures in their operations, but they still have to learn the whole evolution of doing surgical procedures, starting with the, the, the manual part of that process. I, I'm not sure if that will be different even two decades from now. They would start with that, maybe they would go through a bit faster through the, uh, the manual part of the, the evolution of uh, the job that surgeons have been doing. All right, let me see another question. Uh, thank you, Sandra, for confirming that the stream is okay, that you can see me and hear me well enough. There's a, not even a question, just a statement from Subrio, Chat, uh, Subrio Chatterjee. The state of AI and machine learning in health tech. Well, um, the reason why I won't talk about that is that we ded I dedicated plenty of live streams to AI specifically and that uh, you can find a lot of articles, really good ones, uh, about the basics of these technologies. Let me just share one with you. I know I always share that, but that's one of the, the my favorite papers of all time. We wrote a short guide uh, from the Medical Futurist Institute. We published a short guide for medical professionals in the era of artificial intelligence. That's not just for medical professionals, let me state that quite clearly, but it's about the whole idea of using automation in healthcare to the definition and the levels of AI, the simplest ones, uh, the major methods of supervised learning, unsupervised reinforcement and deep learning with real life examples from healthcare. Uh, we talk about the, the advantages of using AI as well as the dangers. This is a free paper that anyone can access. It's in open access, of course, like the way we always publish papers at this institute and you are more than welcome to check it out. Um, and it's there's quite an intriguing question. Let me share that with you. It's Ivo Juster. Uh, of course, first of all, thank you so much for the, the donation, the support, and for also asking this quite insightful question. It's about what is it that doctors do today in diagnosis that can be replicated by today's AI, but that in 10 years, AI will be better at. And how can the practice of medicine evolve to take advantage of that? It's a very good question to ask. First of all, I think that we have to say out loud that practicing medicine is not a linear process. It doesn't work in a way that if I can measure everything about you, all your data, lifestyle insights, information about your disease and health management, do all the radiology scans. If we do all that, we can definitely make the bad decisions about your case. That's just unfortunately not how medicine works. So the way a human mind with their expertise and knowledge and experience can look at the case and trying to find those missing dots or trying to fill the gaps, I think is the part that will be still missing until we'll only have artificial narrow intelligence, the first level of AI. Maybe with artificial general intelligence, we could get closer to that, but we are still far away from that second level of AI as um, uh, Nick Bostrom 
define these three levels. What they have today is artificial narrow intelligence, one algorithm performing a very well-defined single task. And that's, I think that's the part that cannot be replicated by today's AI. But in 10 years, I think even that, that part, I'm not saying could be replicated, but could be augmented by what automation can bring to the table. I don't see physicians being being replaced here, but I do see physicians not being able to work without the support of artificial narrow intelligence. Simply because when there are 32, 33 million medical studies out there, nobody can go through even just a minority of those. It's physically impossible that we can go through all the data that we can obtain now about patients based on the digital health gadgets and genomic reports they might have at home. So I think that's the part that, that will require the expertise, but will be supported and augmented maybe, if I can say that, by automation. Uh, Farhan Najib, thank you for the question. To be honest with you, medical tourism is something I have never looked at. It's just not a technological issue. Uh, it's more like something from like uh, economics. I have no expertise in that. I have never analyzed any trends around medical tourism. So I'm, I'm afraid I, I won't be able to help you with that. Help you with that. Uh, Babak Hassan Shahi, as I have read your last article about Metaverse, would you please speak about the future of digital health and Metaverse in more detail? And do, do you have any suggestions for future work that we can work on? Absolutely, I would love to. Um, I always had some issues about virtual reality. Um, I've never been convinced enough about technology. And when I heard about Zuckerberg's plan about the Metaverse, I felt like it's a Ready Player One becoming real. It's like science fiction becoming real. I, I had, um, I mis I had uh, doubts, quite huge doubts about that. And then a week later, I, I bought my first VR gear. I have now at home a virtual reality device. And my opinion changed since then uh, because it, it can be an immersive experience. I think the technical difficulties are still there. And you have to be a geek to be able to operate such a device at home and to be able to use these its potentials but once you can do that it's a, a mind it can be a mind-blowing experience and i'm thinking about using games for rehabilitation after a stroke or a cardiac arrest or an accident i'm talking about using vr for with kids uh, or using vr in psychology like treating phobias and uh, anxiety like fear of public speaking and, and, and things like that but in general, just the experience of being in a virtual world can be amazing and terrifying at the same time. So um, I always felt after like playing one hour of VR games that I had to just go out to nature to see a tree in real, uh, because that's how much it can mess with your brain. I do think that the VR, the metaverse, we will be able to um, come into our lives in practice in the next five or 10 years if the device that the price of the devices will be cheap enough and affordable enough i do think that we could use the metaverse for healthcare and medical purposes there have been quite many studies on if you go to google scholar and do a, just a quick search for virtual reality you will find a myriad of studies from using vr for pain management and reusing pain scores for patients staying at the hospital for longer times to rehabilitation psychology mental health and so on but I also think that our brains have not been wired to evolution to get ready for such an experience. I'm not talking about becoming dizzy after a VR experience. I'm talking about losing touch with reality. And I'm afraid that for millions, the experience will be so much better than real life that there is a chance that they will lose touch with reality. I don't want to be too pessimistic here, but just give it a try. Try a, a VR experience and, and I think you will see. Uh, what I have in mind. But to answer your, the last part of your question, I would focus on real life patient or clinical needs. That's what you need. If you want to develop something for the metaverse, you need to find real life patient or clinical needs that have not been met by other technologies. When they give a VR device to a patient, expecting that by using a VR experience and like flying over Iceland, patients would feel better, usually it doesn't happen. But when their physicians have to act like a coach in the process and they can work together, discuss the expectations, the use of the technology, and then they use the VR device, do the same, have the same experience, then their pain scores got to use significantly. You see, if the technology is only there to improve the doctor-patient relationship, 
is going to work. If the technology is the final purpose, uh, I'm afraid there has to be a very good reason for the technology to work in practice. All right, very good questions keep coming in. Thank you so much, guys, for being here. It's great to have you from all around the world. I know that you're very kind with your time when taking part in these sessions. So I'm trying to answer here as many questions as I can. Vin Tanjashiri, I'm always sorry if I pronounce your names in the wrong way. I'm sorry about that. With the technology, such as AI, will the healthcare system go more towards the path of hyper-speciality or more towards prime towards primary care? It's a multi-layered question, a very good one, by the way. And I will try to answer that from, from all those, the perspective of all those layers. The first layer is, I do think that the first line of care is not going to be primary care because it's just not affordable and it's a luxury for us to have been able to meet a physician in person for every minor health issue we might have. I think as 5 million healthcare workers are missing worldwide, the first line is going to have, to, it will have to be um, a technological line of care, uh, a chatbot based service, an algorithm in the cloud, something that can obtain data about us and then make a decision whether we have to be prioritized and be able to talk to a physician, not even meet first, just talk to one remotely, and then if needed, meet one in person. And a second perspective or layer here is the is the multi-speciality aspect of it. I mean, the holistic medicine approach has been in discussions for decades, and we are still not there. If you become a medical special, spe if you go into a medical specialty today, you have to go even deeper down the rabbit hole than a physician 5, 10 or 15 years ago. Therefore, for someone to go that deep into the into one specialty, because the level of knowledge you, you need and expertise in that cave, uh, it's really hard to pursue holistic medicine and look at the patient as a whole, not just by focusing on your specific field of interest. But I do see better cooperation between specialties. Uh, I just don't see how physicians should focus on several specialties at once. I see a much higher chance for Physicians diving into the expertise, uh, expert cave or rabbit hole of these specialties and then being able to cooperate with each other much better than the first scenario. So thank you for the question. Uh, Dr. Yogesh Dukare, it's good to see you again on the chat. How feasible it is to, for doctors in one country to teleconsult patients in other countries with laws and reimbursement framework pause as barrier in providing healthcare beyond boundaries? A very good question, a very technical question. I do think there is a boundary here um, because of ethical, legal, even social, financial, and regulatory considerations. But digital one of the major big picture changes of digital health is that it, make, it makes patients the point of care and also it makes, it makes healthcare globalized. And while it is making healthcare globalized as an individual patient, because of my access to digital health technologies, remote care services, smartphone apps, digital health sensors, I think I depend more, my healthcare depends more on um, the access to these than on my country's healthcare system. Um, I know it's a brave thing to say out loud, but that's how digital health makes healthcare globalized. So if uh, there is a service in a country and there is there are no regulatory frameworks or systems being worked out between that country's healthcare system and mine, but through online access, I can use their service from afar um, without them giving me medical advice. That's possible. They can give me recommendations, but not medical advice. They cannot prescribe medications for me, of course, but they can give me insights and I'm fine with that. Then neither I nor them would care about the regulatory legal considerations because there are none. But when you want to receive proper care, it means they have to be able to prescribe medications for you to see your medical records, your past family history and so on. In those cases, regulatory frameworks have to be in place. Therefore, those, those successful remote care services I have seen to be in place so far have only taken part, have only taken place in, in, in one country. So within one country's borders, those services have been able to provide healthcare for consumers. I didn't say citizens because consumers can still be people from a foreign country, but they have to be, uh, they have to belong to the same country's healthcare system. 
Lycurgos Sardis, thank you for the question. Let me share it with others too. Um, and thank you so much for keeping the questions coming in. Um, without one letter, how do you see electronic health records in the future? Would it help if there was one application, native or web app, in which you can have all your medical examinations and all health data um, as... So I guess you just continue the question. Yes, X actionable. Okay, I can't... Well, let me try to copy-paste the same thing here as actionable data for preventive analytics for your health. Also having the ability to export and share anything you want with your physician based on your needs at a time. Of course, I see a reasoning in that and I would love to see such a service in, in place, but that's not going to happen simply because of the regulatory, um, legal, financial considerations I just talked about because of our previous question. Actually, like in my country, we have such a system in place. All my medical records, my examinations, every test I have from radiology to blood test, either in a public or a private institution, can be found on one, on one digital profile. That's my digital healthcare profile. Any healthcare professional can access that, and I can give specific access to some people. Uh, but all the, things, all the things I've used in my healthcare system, again, private or public, can be found on that platform and while that's it and i cannot share more data with my medical records through that so even if i bring data uh, from my digital health sensors i cannot include them in my medical records so there are you see barriers uh, or obstacles to overcome but more or less the uh, experience of accessing such data is here but what you are suggesting is the key part to provide further insights. Uh, that's That would be the ideal um, thing to see, the ideal business to see in action. Like one hour ago, I had an interview with um, uh, an instructor from Tufts University in the US because they have a course about digital health and I give an interview about how I see this, its future. And one of their questions was, if we give you, if we gave you $5 million, what would you do with that? And that's what I said. I said, that I told them that I would develop a service that could obtain, collect, and gather all data, information, insights, medical records about the patient's case from the consumer-based technologies the patient uses to their medical records that can be found in their medical system and try to come up with suggestions, additional insights about how to further calibrate their lifestyle or disease management to, that might lead to better decisions. That's what I would do, but only if I had $5 million and an um, ideal word because in, in real, it would be almost a mission impossible to make it happen. So thank you for the question. All right. Zila Vaminaye, thank you for the question and welcome from, from Africa. How do you think African countries can make progress like Western countries in digital health? There is a huge focus on strengthening information management systems in Africa currently. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. It's, um, it's, it's a weird question to ask because uh, whenever I look at certain African countries like Rwanda or Nigeria or Kenya, I always see, I think, even more practical and better digital health examples being implemented in their healthcare systems than the ones we have in, in more developed countries. In more developed countries, the healthcare infrastructure might be better. I give, it, I give that to you. But regarding digital health, um, like in, let's take Rwanda's example because literally today I analyzed the news article about this, how Babylon Health, a UK-based company, uh, started an even longer partnership with the Rwandan health government, providing AI for their medical record systems. We don't have AI in my country's medical record system, but Rwanda has. It's, uh, that's the kind of difference I'm talking about here. So in digital health, I think they could take, take a leap into that area instead of building... Um, healthcare infrastructure you also see in other countries in more developed countries and when you take a leap then you can be a bit more brave a bit more experimental about the technologies you might want to see being implemented in your country system like in rwanda they have medical drones delivering vaccines and packages to rural areas they have um, ai in the medical record systems I think about 60% of patients can access remote care through telemedical services. We cannot do that in my country. So from that perspective, they have more digital health than we have. But I understand, I think, I, I, think, um, I assume I understand your question 
your the part of your question that I guess you're talking about the, the the patient empowerment part here that in more consumerist countries it's easier to implement digital health based services because consumers want to see those services they can pay for those services there's a business need for companies to keep on providing such services i understand that from that perspective um, western countries have an advantage but for other from other the other perspective the african countries have an advantage I know that a very interesting report will come out from the Broadband Commission, I think in Q1 in 2022. And though I, 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 I cannot describe the details of the report, but I've seen it recently. And I know that they will come up with eight examples and seven of the, six, eight examples and six of, six of those will be about African countries. So obviously, digital health is booming in those countries. Uh, Likurgos, so yes, but in the system you describe in your country, do you actually own the info or is it stored in many different places? For example, stored in the private or public institutions servers. It's a good question to ask. I think um, legally I own the data, but practically I don't. And it's stored in one place though. And every health institution I'm using services from must upload the data to the same digital platform. So it's in one place. I can download it. I have access to it, but why again, ethically and legally it's mine. I know that the data physically is on the, on their servers and I cannot move the data from there. I can download it again, but the same data would remain on the same server. That's, that's part of, I guess, being a citizen in the country's healthcare system. Uh, Monica Feldman, thank you for the excellent question because you will just drive me into talking about one of our topics for today. Uh, and then I will show you the two infographics. I almost forgot about that. What are your thoughts on the voiceify of healthcare? I guess you are implying the, the vocal biomarker um, market here, using voice activated devices for delivering and monitoring health real time, like Alexa Echo and all these. Of course, I think those are useful in niche areas, like where compliance could be an issue, like with elderly patients or where the digital literacy of patients is limited. So again, with elderly patients or patients dealing with mental health conditions, it, I could see a place for them. But book, vocal biomarkers are even more interesting. And that's the point where I want to dive into showing you one of the newest infographics. We just came up with, I will show you two. The first one is about the milestones or key events in artificial intelligence development in healthcare and medicine. I, I read a review study uh, about two weeks ago and I based on the idea they had in a table uh, showing the key milestones of the history of AI development in healthcare. I wanted to create the one, the one infographic on which we mark those uh, areas which we have found to be the, the real milestones in this space. Let me start with the, the bottom part of this infographic starting from 1963 the first computer-based diagnosis of primary bone tumors, and then the first computer digitized X-ray developed for radiology, and then the first surgical robot being launched, and the first non-invasive glucose monitoring system, the GlucoWatch was launched. IBM Watson could beat human contestants at the Jeopardy game show. It was not yet healthcare-based, but it had healthcare-based questions. Then the FDA approved the first smartphone ECG that used algorithms. Then um, what's, IBM Watson was started being used by oncologists um, and the first AI software using AI for patient care and then for medical device uh, was approved by the American Food and Drug Administration. In 2018, the American Medical Association came out with its first AI policy about explainable AI. Then in 2019, the first report about a potential outbreak in Wuhan of COVID-19 came out from a Canadian AI-based startup, not even a healthcare company. Then we published the first database of FDA-approved AI-based medical technologies. Then the first uh, technology was reimbursed for hospital use. And then one of my favorite sci-fi examples, the first AI-guided portable ultrasound device, device came out. And now the newest thing is that the FDA approved their own database and published their own database of AI-based medical technologies. I think what, what the infographic shows is that it has been quite a, um, a steady progress. I mean, we are talking about 60 years here. If you zoom in, it's like 20 years of AI development and 
this area is just i mean it will it's like rocket science it, it's like a rocket going into space right now it's blooming it's it's the potentials are really amazing here if you look at the number of studies uh, focusing on ai for medical and healthcare purposes you would find extraordinary numbers for 2020 and 2021 partially based because of the pandemic and the second one i wanted to show to you uh, the second infographic we will just release after the Q&A live is over. So, of course, you are the first ones to see the infographics. Uh, here it is. I, I saw a, a very funny image about you know, what, com what companies uh, think using AI in healthcare looks like. And it was just uh, like this flow chart like from data. We use AI and then we get value. But I wanted to show people what using AI in healthcare actually looks like. And I started showing things like we have to deal with data annotation, synthetic data, self-reported data by patients, and then clinically diverse data, which are not even cleaned. And then when we use AI, we're talking about data cleaning and supervised, unsupervised reinforcement and deep learning and training data. And uh, last part here, legal issues, ethical considerations, data security, privacy issues. Uh, adapting low i mean regulating locked versus adaptive algorithms and when you come back to the third part of the value part well you have to identify bias you have to focus on prospective studies in, in instead of the retrospective studies we always see in the medical literature whether it's a clinical or patient outcome and whether it would get regulatory approval it's an awfully complicated and challenging field and i just I wanted to raise awareness about how important it is to have a clear picture about where AI is heading. And uh, I think it's it's an extraordinarily fun image that uh, from this, that people generally think that this is how it works. Well, when you look into the real details, you find out that's a beast of a topic. And these are the two infographics we will release after the live Q&A is over. Uh, and one more thing, I wanted to talk about a little, little bit about uh, some of the articles will come up very soon on medicalfuturist.com. One is around the idea, as every year we do a prediction. I don't like to call them predictions, but it's something close to a prediction because we, I mean, I like to come up with um, trends we focus on. So I don't think that predicting things is helpful when it comes to what a futurist should do. I mean, I can try to give you predictions about you know, when this or that thing will happen, but how would that help you? But by highlighting which trends I would like you to focus on more, I believe that I can be more useful. Like uh, in 2020, I highlighted one of the trends that uh, the Google, even though Google acquired Fitbit, the makers of the um, fitness smartwatches and trackers, they would not use the range of trackers Fitbit had but they will develop their own line of fit, uh, fitness trackers based on the experience they can buy from Fitbit. And they just announced that like a few days ago. So I think that's, can be, that, that's what can be useful here, not predicting things when this or that would happen. And in that sense, there are some trends we will focus on more in 2022. One of these is vocal biomarkers. Just You can just find a, an article about that on medicalfutures.com. In that, we talk about how your voice can be used to predict the onset of diseases like Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, how your voice can be used uh, for diagnosing conditions today, such as COVID-19, based on how you can cough into a smartphone's microphone. And it has really amazing potentials uh, for, for diagnostic reasons. And uh, that's, that's one topic we have been analyzing quite thoroughly for the last couple of months. And that's one topic I would like you to focus on. The second is definitely a topic, um, I'm not sure everyone understands how important this topic is, but every time I have a chance to do that, I will make sure to, to remind you that this is huge. I mean, last summer, this summer we talked about tech giants marching into healthcare. We analyzed all the six technology giants and how they want a piece of the healthcare pie. But this thing, I mean, not health, non-healthcare companies trying to provide primary care I think it's, it's simply crazy. It's crazy. I mean, Best Buy and um, CrossFit and, and companies like that providing not, not healthcare services, not a lab test in a, you know, Costco or Tesco, primary care service. It's crazy that non-healthcare companies think that 
they can provide healthcare. They don't have any experience. They don't know anything about regulations, the legal considerations, ethical ones. They have never, never practiced medicine before, but still they think practicing primary care is just like that. You know why? Because they think it's a technological thing now. Because how many technologies patients and physicians have to use today, because of that, they think it's just a technological thing to do. And they are good at developing technologies people want to use. So why not providing primary care after all? And they will fail. I mean, I think their this effort they are putting into this is very much important to healthcare in general. And I will I will love to see the competition coming up because of that. But they will fail, I believe. And what they should do instead is cooperating with medical, healthcare and pharma companies that have the medical healthcare expertise already. And what these healthcare medical biotech companies should do is to cooperate with technology and non-healthcare companies that, that are much better at developing technologies people want to use. That's not something healthcare or pharma companies have been good at. All right. Um, uh, Lucas Hollanda has a question. How can you make emblems pictures to risk get only to people who watch your live videos to make value to motivate us to see all live wise online? Uh, can you please describe what you mean by that? Okay. Uh, it seems Judith Cusco knows already because he should reply that we are already working on this one. Uh, Likurgos Tsardis, thank you for the tip. Have a look at Lung Aware. It is exactly what that for Alzheimer's disease. Dementia, other similar neurodegenerative diseases. Thank you for the tip. I will look into Lung Aware. It's a great recommendation. And besides that, of course, I want to show you something exciting we have been cooking. The newest ebook is out, finally. Oh, we have been working on this for so long. Uh, an ebook about the top 50 digital health trends. More than that, it's a hype cycle of the top 50 digital health trends. And um, I'm really excited about that. Uh, I'm really proud that we could make it happen. Uh, you remember uh, not so long ago, we published this infographic about the, and I even had a dedicated live Q&A to that, the hive cycle of the top 50 emerging digital health trends in 2021. And now this ebook focuses on 2022. And what we've done is that we put all these trends on a, high, on a traditional Gartner hype cycle. And there is a reason why each trend is located on a, at a specific point. And we describe why that trend is there. We describe what that trend actually means. I mean, what AI in diagnostic means or what vocal biomarkers are. And you can see three colors being assigned to each trend. Red means not much progress is expected for the near future. Yellow means moderate progress is in, is in line. And green means a significant progress is expected. And we also describe why that particular trend received this or that color. So in, in this new ebook, um, we describe all these. Again, the details about each trend, the details about the location of each trend on the hype cycle, and how much progress we expect from each. Again, we are talking about 50 digital trends here. And uh, in this article about the ebook, we highlighted three uh, 3D printing drugs, one of my favorite topics of all, using VR in pain management, uh, one of the best examples of digital health so far, and AI in drug design, one of the biggest business opportunities for healthcare and pharma in general. So I think you can see the link in the chat already, and you're more than welcome to get this newest ebook, the 50, the hype cycle of the top 50 digital health, emerging digital health trends. It's uh, hard for me to remember the whole title every time, but so that's, that's what we are proud of now. That's what we have been cooking for you. And Lucas Holanda, yes, I am Brazilian. And what, what I mean is that there's a Brazilian podcast channel in YouTube called Flow Podcast that, that uses a system of emblems type of picture tokens that make value. Thank you for the tip. We will look into that and see whether we can create something uh, unique here. We had a podcast before and we have these live Q&As plus we publish the videos and it would make sense as you mentioning that to combine these uh, several platforms into one. Those who are watching the live video in the moment can take the picture in 24 hour window. It makes sense, but I will just let me mention that we will publish these two infographics uh, today and tomorrow after the live Q&A is over on all our channels, including YouTube. 
uh, on medicalfuturist.com. So Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram, you will find our infographics everywhere. Um, Aldo Sandroni, thank you for the question. Hi from Rome, Italy. What do you think about Vivo Corporation, rewarded by Deloitte recently as a pioneer of digital health sharing economy? I have never come across them, and I'm not sure if I can look into the company in details enough that I could give you an answer now. But what I can promise to do is that, okay, they just won the Deloitte award. Let me share it with you. Why don't you look at the same thing I'm looking at right now? So they just won the Vivo, the Deloitte Technology Fest 500 award. Uh, they have a quantified self sector. They have a technology, smart, start monitoring and collecting your daily bioparameters. It, I mean, it sounds great. There are many companies doing the same, but it sounds great. There is a subscription service, I guess, based on at home lab tests. Okay, I would love to see how this thing works. Do you think I can get into that? Products? Oh, they have many. A whole generation of watches. I know. Let's look at this one. Okay, it's loading. It's a new year of Vivo devices. Ooh, okay. Medical grade sensors. Okay, it's always very, you have to be very cautious saying such things out loud. You have to be, I mean, I'm not saying they don't have, I just, I'm just saying that they have to have re regulatory approval to be able to say that. So built in uh, quality PPG signals, um, blood oxygen. Okay. Vascular aging is a tricky thing to measure ECG. All right. Variable device convenience with monitoring of body temperature. That's very useful. Not many health hackers can do this. How do you Okay. Not many health hackers can do the same. Oxygen saturation, blood pressure. Okay. It's a very hard thing to do. I have here the, Om the Omron smartwatch, which is quite a huge thing to use. And they have been approved to, to measure blood pressure. And it's not an easy thing to do. And many other health parameters. Uh, you can make payments with your watch. Mm -hmm. I mean, it looks, it looks interesting. They claim many things that not even huge companies have been able to make happen from stress levels to ECG and blood pressure. And I would feel more comfortable testing the technology myself before giving you an estimation or a suggestion or a recommendation. But thank you for the tip. I will dive into that even more. Uh, <laughs> Integral Doc, what a question to ask. Let me share that with everyone else here. Um, I've been tasked with conceptualizing a group of super luxury health resorts in the Caribbean. <laughs> Good for you. With your well-earned insight into the future of medicine, what would you advise me to look at? I mean, if it's about real estate, I can't help you with that, or medical tourism, that's, as I mentioned before, that's not my cup of tea. If it's if the question is about what kind of technologies I can envision in such luxury health resorts, then please confirm, and I'm happy to think about that. Uh, Sartak Tivari, Thank you for the good question. What do you think about pharmacogenetics? That I think, I mean, uh, I did my PhD in genomics. I feel much closer to genomics than any other fields within the future of medicine. Uh, I think I think pharmacogenomics could be the most practical field in genomics, meaning that just giving people a chance to know what medications would definitely cause them a side effect would be of tremendous value. I have, I've only seen a few services worldwide doing that. It's just really an awful image to paint here. Uh, since the completion of the Human Genome Project, it has been like a, a huge failure but to see a rise of pharmacogenomic services because it's so much more easier to describe what medications could cause me side effects than to give me an estimation of my chance to get this or that medical condition. Um, okay. And we have an, an article about pharmacogenomics. Thank you. Thank you, Judith, for sharing that. Although, of course, my, my pleasure. I'm, I'm sorry for that's all I could tell you now. So, yes, Integral Doc, thank, thank you for confirming that. Um, if, if it's a luxury health resort, then I assume that people go there to have some rest while using healthcare services. I know that the general idea about such lux luxury resorts will be around having a um, state-of-the-art medical practice where they measure everything about you. But now we know that that's not how healthcare works and that's just not useful. 
So I guess um, what could be done in those places is, I mean, I don't think it can be done. I mean, what I wanted to say that is to launch patient empowerment as an idea, to play, to uh, to plan that idea into the minds of people that by using a few technologies while you are at the resort, like um, you can get a whole genome sequencing service, maybe a microbiome test, you would get a few variables to use like state tracking, fitness tracking, and you can bring those home. But while you are there, they could, they would show you the, the power of the data in those trackers and how the power and the data you can obtain about yourself. I know it's a very idealistic way of looking at it, but that's what I would do. That would have, I think, value instead of uh, bringing those those um, tourists and patients through uh, the biggest radiology machines and measuring everything about them. I, I don't think that would lead to any meaningful medical decisions. Uh, Lucas, I th I think I understand now what you are referring to, and I I. I think that by joining our YouTube, by becoming a YouTube, not just a subscriber, but a member, we have a YouTube membership here, a few dollars per month, you would get such uh, emoticons that nobody else gets. You would get videos before everyone else. You would even get videos we don't share with anyone else. So I guess that's the kind of system we have here. There's a join button in the bottom. You can check it out and you would get customized emblems that what you call emoticons uh, through that uh, channel. All right. Um, I stem cells for storage. Oh, um, I see um, integral doc. It, it, I guess it makes sense, but I, I would not do something like I do. I wouldn't use a service of that long term during a stay at a resort than like a stem cell storage. But I see the business reasons for doing that. Um, Okay, integral lifestyle medicine, dietary advice, fitness, stress management. I mean, it makes sense, but I would do that with data. Not to do that why they are there and that's it, but to show them how much they could learn about their lifestyle choices or medical decisions they make with their medical professionals through the data they already own. Monica Feldman, why do you classify longevity? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hoped that someone would come up with that. I mean... If we go to the infographic, uh, let me share it with you. Oh, you think it works that way? No, it doesn't. Still not. Ah, give me a second here. <laughs> what matters here is that you can see longevity research being on the top. Um, on, on the top of the hive cycle, but it's red. And then, can, then comes the question from Monica. Why do you classify longevity research as technology with little progress? Biomarkers can be measured and put together using AI and digital health in vertical and longitudinal analysis. I work on it, work in it. It's very good for you and we need such research. It's red because if you look at the number of studies that have come out recently, last five years, maybe 10 years, and that the results of those have been put into practice, then it's a red progress. If you look at the same with VR in pain management, you see a, an amazing effort being put into bringing results from studies into the everyday practice of medicine. Longevity is a thing. Um, I get it, but I have, a, I have a bad relationship with the term. I think it has a bad connotation because longevity research always implies to me that we have to wait for a miracle drug uh, to appear in the market, and then that will treat lo lo aging as a disease. While I believe that, and I'm happy to, to have a bet with anyone in the world, that we have a better chance for a longer and healthier life just by patient empowerment in itself, by just accessing our own data and medical records and being involved in our decision making, than if we had to wait for a miracle drug to appear. And in that sense, it's possible to see Great results, great practical results coming out of longevity research in a decade or five years, 10 years from now, but not today. It's on the top of the hype cycle and I think it will it will go down from there uh, quite significantly because it's um, hard to um, contribute to that field now. Integral Doc and Aldo uh, Sandroni, thank you so much for becoming a members 
in the YouTube section. Welcome to that and, and being our members. Now you can access um, emoticons. You have priority on the chat with questions and you will see videos before everyone else. Plus you will see videos nobody else sees because we uh, produce videos for our YouTube members. So thank you so much for, for supporting the, the team, the Medical Futurist team in that sense. Dr. Jamshed Moidu. Okay, let me share the question with the others. We have a few minutes more for some questions. So we are moving to total body surveillance in the near future with those sensors devices. Each organ is going to have a device to monitor 24-7. I don't think so. I don't think that would work. I don't think um, that that's what physicians and patients would look for. I do think that some patients would love to have at least one seamlessly working, almost invisible sensor on their body. And if something is about to go wrong, either they would get notified or if something goes wrong, they fall, they have a heart attack and the healthcare system would get notified. I, I, I can see the, the value in that, but not for each organ, not for the entire human body. It just doesn't make that sense. It would be too much effort without enough uh, clinical outcomes. But I would love to have such a monitor on myself uh, in general. Monica, can we change longevity research to health span research instead? It moves away from the sick care model to healthy life. Uh, it sounds good, but that's what they call it. They call it longevity research. There's a longevity research community, and I have never seen a health span research. I, it sounds better, but I've never seen a health span research community um, so far. But um, yeah. It's about terminology. I'm, I'm open to discussions, but the longevity research we are referring to on the hype cycle is specifically referring to longevity research, not just health span. I think health span research, I mean, you are the expert, of course, but health span research belongs to the umbrella term longevity research, right? It's a subspecialty or subfield under longevity research in general. But I think we are getting uh, to the end of our time. Uh, Joseph Ivan or Ivan, one more question. What do you think about anesthesiology field in the future? It's a very hard question to ask uh, uh, Joseph because we have been analyzing the top 20 medical specialties and the impact automation and digital health technologies can have on them. And anesthesiology was not one of them because it's a, it's a specialty where of course, medical. we see the future of medical technologies, but at the medical futurists, we like to focus on digital health technologies, technologies that provide data to both patients and their medical professionals. And in anesthesiology, uh, we don't see much of a use for those. Maybe while anesthesiologists have a general discussion before a procedure with patients, maybe then the data they can bring to the table would be of value, but that's not specific to anesthesiology. That's why we, we have not even included anesthesiology in the uh, top 20 medical specialties and the future of those specialties, the ebook we published not so long ago. Uh, Integral Doc, now as a member, you have priorities. I have to answer your question for sure. Uh, are there, okay, let me share the question with the others too. Are there any AI assisted platforms that extrapolate the results of genomic testing into practical lifestyle change? We wish, <laughs> we wish. Um, I mean, there are uh, direct to consumer genomic companies like uh, MyDNA, 23andMe, um, Danta Labs, Atlas Biomed, where I do think they use machine learning based algorithms when analyzing the data, but I can confirm that. And the platforms are specifically not assisted by uh, AI-based solutions. Uh, but that would be the wish of all of us that I had my I have my whole genome sequencing service. I even have my microbiome service or testing. And then using the the uh, the potentials of AI, seeing through the context of my data and the, the, the layers of my data, trying to give me lifestyle insights or even suggestions about medical decisions. Like, let's have this dietary product and not the other one, uh, because based on my microbiome and genomic data, I would go better with those. So in that sense, I absolutely see the potentials of that technology, but not yet. Circle DNA is something like that. Then uh, let me have a look at it. The most, the world's most comprehensive DNA test. It's always a very special line to say out loud. And of course they have holiday sale right now. Um, once where I have to show it to you. 
one swab and plus 500 plus insights that embrace the, the give jesus christ the, the gift that keeps on giving i have to check it out I'll check it out uh, and, and the details of those because i had my whole genome sequence on how you can be more comprehensive than a whole genome sequencing service so what i would love to see and what i will dive into is what kind of um, health risks they might be able to deliver cancer risks disease risks health reports i think that's quite similar to what uh, atlas atlas biomed has been doing um i guess they provide a genetic counselor as well yes okay it's very important wow they are pushing quite hard for me to buy a service but th thank you for the tip i will dive into them even more so thank you so much for being with me being with us today again it was the last live stream of the year uh we will have live stream every single month in 2022 let's be honest that has been quite a turbulent year 2021 i think we have learned a lot about ourselves about healthcare about trust in um, science and, and healthcare communications uh, we've learned about each other and how much responsibility we can give to each other about how they see their social responsibility going into 2022. I'm an optimistic person, so I do hope that with the tools we get from science and with the expertise medical professionals have, we will have a bright 2022. We will beat this pandemic. It will become an endemic uh, if we vaccinate enough people. Um, and then I think we have a historic chance. I'm sorry for being so romantic here in the last two, three minutes, but I do think that there is a historic chance now um, to put the cultural transformation healthcare has been longing for next to the technological adoption that took place because, the pan because of the pandemic. That's a historical chance. And I do believe in the power of patient empowerment, in the power of uh, the new skills and approaches medical professionals can obtain and how we consumers can push regulators and policymakers to, to make all these technologies becoming real happen. So then we can have a bright 2022 looking into the future. One thing is sure, I will be here next year. We will be here for you at the Medical Futurist. We will keep on analyzing news. We will keep, I will keep on go through a hundred news items every day and choose those five that we think you should see. You should know about we will keep on publishing executive summaries and ebooks we will keep on publishing youtube videos and articles on medicalfuturist.com and there are two ways now through which you can support what we do so we can keep on providing for free one is by becoming a patron on patreon.com slash the medical futurist the reason why is that it's worth doing that is that patrons receive different content than everyone else in the medical futurist universe Second is by buying the ebooks that we publish. We have about eight or nine ebooks now available on leanpub.com. And you can become a member on YouTube, as you can see. So uh, it's a new feature we have. These are the three reasons or three ways you can support our work at the Medical Futurist. And one more way is coming. The biggest thing, I'm, I'm so sorry, I cannot tell you more details, but the biggest thing we have been working on and far the biggest thing I have personally worked on for the last couple of years will come out very early 2022. I can't wait to be able to share the details with you. That's the biggest thing we have been cooking at the Medical Futurist. But for now, I think that's enough of me, enough of us. I hope you are safe, that you can spend time with your family. You can go out to nature and enjoy real life, not losing touch with reality. And that uh, we will have a, a bright and optimistic 2022. Thank you so much for being with me, being with us for the whole year and for supporting us through many ways even just by reading the content we publish or by supporting us financially. We very much appreciate that. Have an excellent uh, Christmas time or holidays time and have a great new year. Thank you again. Bye.